I'm doing my talk today on the motivational value of failure. Can somebody just go ahead and demystify that word and shout, failure? failure. Let's do it one more time. Failure. failure. That word is a feared word. It's a feared feeling. Nobody likes to be called that word. But I learned that there's something even more devastating than failure. It's never trying at all. The number one question that I receive is this. Rashad, how do you do all of it? You see, when you do what you love to do, there's never a all of it moment, right? But that is the number one question I get from radio to inboxes, my friends, my associates. How do you do it all? And I considered what all I do. So I'm going to give you a rundown of all I do. Not to brag, but just to give you some context, okay? So all I do is this. I have a radio show on News and Talk 1380, WAOK, Monday through Friday. See some of y'all out here. I'm the political and social commentator for the People Station B103, the largest urban station in the United States of America. I'm the chief editor for Rolling Out Magazine, which we print in all 25 major markets throughout the country, and we are the largest free print urban publication in the country. Beyond that, I'm also a university professor. I'm finishing my second doctoral degree, so in 10 months, y'all pray for a brother that he has doctorate number two. Now, how did I get to that place? First of all, by the grace of God. You see, I would be lying to you if I said anything else first. First of all, by the grace of God. But there's a history connected to my current story that rarely gets talked about. And I want to talk to you about my actual history. And there came a time in my life when I realized that the disaster of my past was never a disaster at all, but it was simply preparing me for what was in front of my journey. How many of you have ever been criticized before? Everybody, right? Do we like criticism? Typically, no. But I learned this on the journey. Criticism is the price you pay for leadership. Oh, come on now. Criticism is the price you pay for leadership. And the day you are unwilling to be criticized is the day you are unfit to lead anybody. Wear criticism like a badge of honor. What's the difference between leadership and influence? Well, leaders, good leaders, are always influential to the positive. But there can be bad leadership, too, that can influence the world to the negative. But one thing about influencers is that influencers have been proven. Because in order to be an influencer, that means that you have, in fact, influenced somebody. When I was around 10 years old, I was coming back home, traveling with my mother and her boyfriend. Her boyfriend was driving, and I was in the back seat. We were coming from the grocery store, and there were groceries in the back seat, and I decided to go through the groceries, and I picked up. Fig Newtons. Y'all remember Fig Newtons, right? And I started to eat them, and my mom's boyfriend was just in a bad mood. And he stopped the car, and he looked in the back seat. He said, boy, who told you to go through them bags? And I mumbled something. I don't remember what it was. I was 10 years old. But whatever I said made this brother angry. And he got out of the car came to the back seat, oh, sorry. opened the back door, took his fist, in a but I don't think and beat me down. Now, I remember those moments like it was yesterday. The truth is, y'all, I remember it like it happened one minute ago. And as he was beating me and saying the words he was saying, who told you to go through my stuff? I thought the most impactful memory would be his fist hitting my face, but it wasn't. 
the memory that stands in my mind today is in between his fists, me looking up at my mother and saying, Mama, don't let this man hit me again. When I looked at her, she was powerless, y'all. She had the look of despair in her eyes, but she could not do anything. When he got finished, he threw me back in the back seat, closed the door, got in the driver's seat and drove home. We were only about five minutes from the house. I already planned what I was going to do, y'all. Now, I'm a kid. I wish I could whoop his ass, but I couldn't. He was too big. So I strategized that as soon as we pull up to the house, I was going to jump out of the car, go into the house, lock the doors, and call 911. Well, that's exactly what I did. Jumped out of the car, went inside of the house, locked every door, and I called 911. And I remember when this, this operator came on the line and I just started crying because I feel as if I found somebody I could talk to. And the operator said, just calm down, young man. The police are on the way. Stay on the phone with me. Outside, my mother and her boyfriend are knocking down the door. Let us in. Well, the police finally got there. The operator told me I was safe. So I hung up the phone with her. I went to the door because I wanted to hear this cop lock this monster up. But the truth is, on the inside, I was conflicted because I had love for this brother. He had never struck me before. I was fond of him. My father wasn't in the household. He was at least there temporarily. Well, as I'm listening to what's happening outside by pressing my ear against the door, I hear this cop, and it's obviously a white male voice, and he steps up and he says, Mr. Commissioner, what seems to be the problem? Did y'all hear me? I was too young to understand exactly what that meant, but I was old enough to know he wasn't going to jail. The police officer proceeded to have a conversation with both him and my mother. And the police officer said, if I don't open the door, he was going to take me to jail. So I opened the door. I remember going straight to my room. I had a partial black eye, I had a busted lip. I went into my room. I didn't know I was depressed already, but that's exactly what I was. I went to sleep. I didn't want to wake up. Well, I forced myself up at about 6 a.m. that morning, well before I was supposed to be in school. And I decided to get dressed, to get ready, to brush my teeth, wash my face, bypass breakfast, bypass my mother, bypass him. And I went outside to wait for the bus. I was outside two hours before the bus even came because I was depressed. I wanted to escape. When the bus came, I got on. Nobody asked about my black eye. Nobody asked about my busted lip. I was actually quite relieved because I didn't want to make up a lie. I still would have protected him. I went through my school day. I came back home. You know, the love of a child is very strong. I had already envisioned in my mind of how I was going to hug him and tell him, I'm sorry. I never got that chance. When I came to my house, I went to open my front door, and my key didn't work. I attempted to open up my back door, and my back door key did not work. So I'm panicking now, running back to the front of my home, and there's a white van. And this woman, this African-American female, as sweet as she could be, she gets out of the van and she says, I'm so sorry, son, I was supposed to be here earlier. And I'm saying, what's wrong? Where is my mother? Can somebody tell me something? And she says, son, I can't tell you anything until you get in the van. So I hurried into that van. That's when I was told, your mother has given you up for adoption. 
Well, during that time in Georgia, they actually would work really hard to place you with somebody in your family. And so I told them about my dad who lived in Atlanta. I told them about my uncle and aunt. But here's the truth. My dad didn't have all his stuff together either. You see, during that time, my dad had fallen victim to the crack epidemic and was involved in his disease totally. But I did what I thought I needed to do. I lied. I lied and said my dad was a stable man because I just wanted to be with family. And my dad, being a remarkable talker himself, he played along with it. He said, oh yeah, it's all good. You know, come on, bring him up here. I got him. I love you, son, because they were listening on the phone. So I came to Atlanta, and I knew a lot of people in Atlanta because I would come to Atlanta during the summertime. So I had cousins and family and friends. I knew people in the neighborhood. It was all good. It was like a home away from home anyway. But in all of that excitement and joy of being back with family that I knew, I really forgot about the disastrous effects of cocaine and crack. Well, I did enroll into school, and my dad did the absolute best job he could do. And just for a note, because I don't want to forget to say it, my dad today is drug-free and a remarkable man. <laughs> Was a remarkable man back then. But he had his turbulence during that time, and his turbulence caused me to have turbulence. He wasn't always in the household. That caused me to be what we would call a street guy. Some of you would have called me a thug. By the age of 11, I became a gangster disciple, 7-4 GD. I was recruited by people I thought loved me. They were older than me. They fed me when I was hungry. They taught me some things. Some of them actually did look out for me. By the age of 12 was the first time I went to juvenile. At the age of 13, my father was arrested. I don't remember what for. But I remember spending the night at my homeboy's house on Glenwood Road in an apartment complex called Arthur's Court. And at this time, I'm looking for who can help me get a job and pay bills. And he said, nobody's going to help you. Nobody's going to give you a job, but I got this 50 slab for you. See, a 50 slab was $50 street value worth of crack cocaine. And he said, if you cut this up the right way, you can make 120 bucks on it. And he taught me how to do that. I didn't realize I was learning a detrimental skill. And I did exactly what he said. And I went out and sold every bit of it the next day. Ladies and gentlemen, I became what destroyed my very family, a drug dealer at the age of 13. So I stayed in the game. 15 years old, I got arrested for crack cocaine with intent to distribute. They caught me. I was in and out of juvenile a lot. At 17, I'm going through life. I still miss my mother. Want my dad to change. But the streets got me. And I love the streets, and the streets love me. I kept it all the way G. At 17 years old, I got arrested again. This time, I was facing 22 years in prison. I remember when the DeKalb County officer was driving me to the jail. I told this cop, I said, bro, you going the wrong way. Panthersville back this way. He said, young man, if you're going to break the law, you need to learn it. That's when Georgia had just passed the law to where 17 meant adult. And I remember that moment. I said in my heart, it just got real. So he took me to DeKalb County Jail. 
I get processed in. I'm with a whole lot of grown people now. Here I am, a failure. At least I felt that way. Not an influence of, of anything. Didn't have anybody to even come put money on my books. Had nobody that would take my collect call. I'm inside of this jail, and three months inside of this jail, I ran into somebody that I actually knew from the hood. His name was Psycho. Y'all laughing, y'all got friends with crazy ass names too. <laughs> and at this time, three months in, I've already gone to magistrate court. My bond is $22,000. Nobody in their right mind will post that bond for me. Three months in, I run into Psycho and I run up to Psycho. I flat forgot that I was inside of jail and I hugged him full body. I'm just happy to see somebody that I know. Damn, these folks crazy in here. He looked at me, he hugged me back. This was one of the hardest cats I ever met in my life on Glenwood Road, was hugging me back, showing me love back. It was a little weird. But I was okay with it. And I remember saying to him, psycho, and his continence completely changed. He said, man, don't you ever call me that again. My name is Ronnie, Ronnie Purvis. I thought that was kind of weird too. I never knew his real name. I didn't think it would be Ronnie though. <laughs> and Ronnie started telling me this whole story about how God had changed his life and about his transition inside of this jail. I said, man, as soon as you get out, you're going to go right back to doing the same thing you used to do. So man, miss me with this Jesus stuff, bruh. He said, Rashad, I'm in here for manslaughter. I'm guilty of it, and I'm going to plead that way. I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. I saw his leadership. His leadership was displayed in its most remarkable way when I saw him walk away from a fight that I knew he could win. When he did that and swallowed all of his pride and all of his ego and humbled himself to a lesser, weaker individual in jail, I said, obviously, this brother has something different inside of him. I started going to church with him. I started going to prayer call at nighttime. And I eventually accepted Jesus into my heart inside of that jail. I said, God, I will be to every man I see what Ronnie Purvis was to me. That was the only promise I made to God. On Christmas Eve, the guard yelled, Richie, pack it up. And everybody in the pod said, stop playing with that kid, man. It's Christmas Eve. See, guards used to play with you back then during holidays. And the guard said, no, nah, man, for real, somebody actually posted this kid's bond. He's free. And I'm getting processed out of the jail, and I'm getting downstairs, and I'm asking everybody, who did this? Who posted this? Who paid $22,000 for me? And when I walked outside, there was a woman named Abanita Powell. <laughs> Abanita Powell had posted the bond. And she said God would not let her sleep until she got me out of jail. The next day was Christmas Day. I was free. I didn't have one gift in my hand, but I had the greatest gift of all, my freedom and my mind. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to leave you with this. I took those two elements, my mental freedom and my physical freedom, and to this day, I stand before you as a man who teaches at the college I used to trap outside of. When I tell you Atlanta not only influences everything, Atlanta knows how to bring you back from nothing to transform the world. That is my talk. I appreciate your time.